um, that I've that I've had with Roland in the Netherlands. So the the Christian Reformed Church has been very conscious of its Dutch roots for a very long time, and and when immigrants leave the Netherlands, they in a sense freeze the culture they leave with. And so there's no little consternation about what has happened to the home country since the folks have left. So, oh yeah, I've been to Michigan, and that's something. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, how do you want to do this? Uh, well, let's let's just talk, and why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, and I'll record it. And if it's something that we think we want to share, we'll share it. And if it's at the end of it, we, I'd like us to speak freely. But if it's something that we say, well, there's stuff in there I don't really want to put on, then we won't put it on. Uh, right. I, often, I often, in conversations like this, I, we have a conversation. And I think based on emails and comments I get, I think, oh, you're asking questions that a lot of other people wonder about. And so then it would be helpful to hear this stuff talked about. So then, but, but sometimes stuff comes up that's of a more personal nature and it isn't appropriate for YouTube. So I don't put it on. So it's kind of the nature. Sounds, sounds fair to me. I'm going to adhere to rule eight as much as I can. <laughs> uh, and, and I figured the most, the most practical thing to do would be to, get to the reason of me asking you if you would like to have a conversation. Okay. And so I got to do the harp sound because we're going way back in time. Okay. Um, I grew up in a small town in the Netherlands, about 2000 people, uh, Christian reformed mostly. And that that's difficult because there's like two different types of reformed churches in the Netherlands and both of the words mean reformed. And I have no idea which one I was brought up. In. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the best description is that we could wear shorts in summer and the women didn't have to wear hats. Okay. Uh, the school that was tells uh, me a lot. right. School was school with the Bible and that, that was the only school with the Bible in the village and it was fairly conservative and there's a bit, so we would get read out of the Bible in the morning. And I remember being told the story out of Kings one. Uh, I think that's on Mount Carmel with the, the priests of Baal, which, I remember kind of interpreting as a my God is bigger than your God story. I mean, that just gets rubbed in because, you know, he starts laying it to the priest like, oh, where's Baal? Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's on the toilet. And, <laughs> and you know, and then, of course, you know, the God of the, the Israelite shows up and boom, here we go. And I remember listening to that story. And I just felt really bad for the priests of Baal. <laughs> and they, and they, don't, they didn't tell the kids what happened to the priests of Baal afterwards. I had to learn that later. <laughs> right. And I must have been like, what, five? And I told my mom, like, well, that's kind of bad because the priests of Baal just did what they believed and they didn't know any better. And, and mom says, well, yeah, but the stories and, you know, God is love and you know, that I was <laughs> right. So when I was really big into dinosaurs and I would bring my dinosaur book to school, like, look what this book says. And teachers didn't know what to do. And my name was Job and I should know better. And there's the behemoth <laughs> in the Bible and the behemoth is clearly a dinosaur. And anyway, that was, a, that was an interesting childhood, but at about 11, apparently, I mean, I, I, I said to my mom, like, what's the point of life? I don't see the point of any of this. Why are we here? We're just here to make it, work or make life go or whatever. I didn't see the point of any of it. And uh, I mean, religion never really caught on. And then I went to high school when I was 12 and I got bullied relentlessly. And that, that kind of mixture brings you into a nice nihilist state as a kid. You didn't, so, have, you didn't have any new appreciation for what was done to the priests of Baal after you were born? <laughs> if, if only I could have sort of reflected on that, that, that might've helped. But, <laughs> I, I just remember being, you know, like clearly life was a cruel joke. And th the only reason that I, I didn't put an end to it is because I was afraid of death. So you're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. And I remember kind of having a sort of revelation in my childhood saying, well, this is just what it's going to be. And I best just slog through, mm. which Peterson would now say you have to carry a cross and 
do what you can because life is suffering, bucko, and, you know, <laughs> deal with it. But I, that was years later that I found him. So life improved eventually. You know, you go through college and you move out and you find a girlfriend and you get jobs and it's all gotten better. But even in the meantime, I'd built this kind of thing in my head that would yell at me constantly about what a failure I was. And well, and in, at night I would lie awake. I mean, I couldn't do anything about it. I would just lie awake, anxious about death. Like, well, and the, the walls, you know, the walls come in, they come to you. Like, you don't know what to do. Like, well, and my wife's like, what's, what's up? I'm like, I'm, I, don't worry. I'm just thinking about death like usual. And, <laughs> no, seriously, that's, it became kind of this, well, this is what life is. And what am I going to do about it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, sh I shouldn't laugh. I mean, the, no, it's it, such a it, bad pastor. People tell me they're, they're, they're existential woes. And I just laugh. <laughs> no, no, it makes it easier to talk about. It's, it's the tragedy of existence, you know? So, um, eventually in my, in my twenties, I, I got into Buddhism, you know, and Zen Buddhism appealed to me. This is what it is. Life contains suffering. Uh, this is what you can best do. Okay. I, I like that. This is the world. And I didn't care for the karma and the rebirth, but Zen Buddhism doesn't really deal with that so much. It's very sort of almost rational. These koans let you kind of get these, these mental breakthroughs. And I kind of, you know, surfed that way for a while. Life got busier. And eventually I ran into Stoicism. Now, Stoicism is cool. I started reading uh, uh, Epictetus, Seneca, Aurelius. I really liked Aurelius. And I got into this podcast. It was called Stoic Metal. Shout out. Um, and the author of Stoic Metal, I think he's a Canadian. Um, he, he journaled to himself every morning, two pages. And what I liked about Stoicism is that it focused on the next act you're going to do and be without in a conflict and don't let yourself be led by your passions and live a virtuous life. And I, you know, it didn't deal too much with gods and I could deal with that because, you know, ration was the one true good and we would get everywhere through science and I'm a computer programmer. So logic is the supreme being. And the, the, the whole logos thing made sense to me. But anyway, back to the journaling, I started journaling and what I noticed is that in journaling, there was no negativity. And I would journal like Marcus Aurelius, like to myself. And there was always this positive voice. Always. Like, that's interesting. So every time I journal, there's this positive voice. But what's that? that? That's unusual. There usually is only the other one. So what's this? So I, I was working at some point and I YouTube the video. Uh, I looked for a video on ethics or virtue ethics or something like that. I was in the mood for that. And I ran into this 2010 video by some Canadian guy who sounds like Kermit the Frog. And he's talking about the necessity of virtue. And I listened to it and he talks about neuropsychology. And suddenly he starts talking about Cain and Abel on the, on the level that I'd never thought about it. And I watched the video and I come home and I told uh, I said, tell to my wife, you know, we're going to watch this during dinner. I got to show you this video. And I, I, and she's like, oh, that's interesting. And I found this other video about him talking about uh, the pathological brain and how reinforcement of negative addictive patterns create these demons in your head and about negative emotion. And like, hey, that sounds familiar. That describes something I'm familiar with. So then you get on the Jordan Peterson train. You're like, there's a subreddit. There's all these Bible videos. There's personality lectures. And all he says kind of makes sense to me. And I kind of try to stay away from the, the bloody postmodernists uh, that he talks about. Because, okay, that's, that's fine. But, you know, it's not really my thing. Um, although it, he did introduce me to philosophers like Heidegger and Derrida and Foucault. And, like, oh, that's cool. That's interesting. Anyway, uh, I get into the subreddit, and there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of stuff there, and sometimes there's good stuff. And at some point, somebody links to you, your video on the axiomatic versus the materialistic God. And I watched the entire thing, and I noticed, like, I'm watching this video, and I could, I could almost feel myself changing. It was really strange. Like, I noticed that things I hadn't thought about for so long, like religion is bunk, God is Santa for adults, 
all these religions are basically bunk, except for the ones I find interesting, like Stoicism and Buddhism. <laughs> Those are cool. But all the other stuff is basically just, you know, people try to figure out how the world works, and we don't really take that seriously. And I noticed that what you said about rationality doesn't get you anywhere. And I thought, hey, Peterson said rationality drives you to nihilism. And that's basically where I ended up. And you said, okay, we have this lineage of stories. And I noticed that, huh? And, and I noticed that through Peterson's videos, I had started to get the urge, and I couldn't explain why, to go to church. And maybe there was something to this Christianity. And of course, to, I was talking to my wife, said, um, am I am I still rational? Have I been have I been appearing manic to you? Because she's my no seriously, she's my safety check. I like I want to make sure I'm not on some train here that that is beyond me. So again, I'm watching your video and say, hey, you know, you should also watch this video. Uh, and we we both found it very interesting, although you know she doesn't respond to it the way I do, but. I noticed that that it was it was changing my ideas about religion, and and uh, okay, so I'm a volunteer firefighter. We had fire training at a local reformed church, one of the old ones. All everything is made out of wood, so if those ones go, you don't want to be there. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, it's all wood. It's 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 dangerous. If those things burn, there's nothing you can do. Uh, but we're there afterwards, and you know. I have a religious upbringing and the fire department is very religious. This town I live in is very religious. There's two churches down my street. And they you know, and they know I have my background because the first question the fire department asked me when I joined was like, which church are you with? And I said, Matthew says, don't judge me there. And like, oh, okay. So he, he knows that <laughs> stuff. Uh, but we were there in the church and I, I, I already know, like, okay, this kind of feels nice. And I'm, I'm continuously checking with myself, like, is that a real thought? Mm. Or am I craving something else? Am I craving community? Am I craving tradition? What is this? Okay. So I'm in the church, and that was fun. And we are done training, and, and uh, a co-worker firefighter says, hey, would you like to come with me to church on Sunday? And they've done that before. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Like, that's new. And now what have I done? <laughs> So I journal to myself, now what have you done? <laughs> like, well, maybe this isn't so bad. And, you know, they don't know you there, so you'll be all right. And so my neighbor was being, he was being confirmed to church elder. And he, he's this great person, you know, he's, 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 he's this person I look up to. And I think his religion makes him that partially. So I went to church and it was fine. It went quite well. The, the, the sermon was on uh, Revelations. Uh, seventh seal, the half hour of silence, the handing out of the trumpets, or I'm not sure what the English words are. And that wasn't so bad. I'm like, huh, this, this, this was kind of nice. So maybe I can try the other type of reformed church. And then I was okay. I'm now consciously going to church and wondering if maybe there is a God. This is, Okay, wife, am I still rational? Because, like, what is this? I no, seriously, Paul. This is. I don't know what this is, and I'm trying to figure it out. But to me, it's like okay. So clearly, clearly, I don't know anything. Because half a year ago, I had way different, way different ideas about existence and rationality. And what I've noticed that, and this is the most important thing, and this is why I wanted partially to have this conversation about four weeks now. I've had no intrusive negative thoughts and I had, have had no compulsive worry about death. And I look at myself in the mirror and I don't hate what I see. It's like the best way to describe that without sounding weird, without sounding irrational, is like I've got a new life, basically. Like stuff, things seem more real. Like that's weird. What is this? This had better not be a religion because that's not <laughs> right. So, and my wife is like, well, clearly this has value to you. You have a, a hierarchy of values. Clearly you should chase this. Yeah. And this is why don't you try 
praying. I'm like, I'm not going to try praying. That's ridiculous. That's, and she says, well, what do you have to get to lose? I'm like, right, but then I'd be that person who prays. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, right. So what would my rational friends think of me? Ah, that's interesting. There's an element of shame there. You perceive yourself as a certain way. See, I've gone through all these things, and I've had endless conversations with myself. And I, and, and I keep having, oh, this is something I should ask Paul. And then I watch one of your sermons and you answer it. Like, okay, can't ask that anymore. Uh, I, yeah, your stuff about Ezekiel. And, and I, I was telling my wife, like, if, if, this, if, if there was a preacher like this nearby, I'd go to church every day because there's, there's a layer of depth in these stories that, that he talks about. And I haven't found that yet in the sermons that I've, I've had here. It's, it's sort of there, it could be there, but it, there's not this level of depth. And, and to be honest, the, the Dutch Reformed pastors don't go out there with the intensity that you, you portray. You know, most of your thumbnails are with your arms out and you're like, that's because this. And like Dutch pastors wouldn't do that. <laughs> I've been in America so, too long. Right, so make of that what you will. Um, where was I? Oh, right. Yeah. I don't know what to do with what I am now. I don't know what this is, what I am and where my main question that keeps coming back when I journal to myself is now what? And, and will I regress back? Because if religion is what does this, because it could be the journaling, then, well, I'll take whatever, because clearly I don't know anything. Six months ago, I thought way different. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of the Cliffs Notes, man. That's what I got. That's my life story, basically. Isn't it fun, though? <laughs> oh, it is. And like, oh, I got, I, I got to read about Kelvin. And I got to, I got to read about, uh, I don't know. I went to my parents like, hey, dad, have you ever heard of this guy called Solzhenitsyn? And it's like, oh, yeah, I got this book. And it's got this ancient copy of the Gulag Archipelago. So you get exposed to all this stuff. Yeah. And that's yeah. so interesting. But yeah. the religious part, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. So I went, okay, if I went all the way back to my base state, which is what, really? But to my base state of our atheism, but which is what, with my religious substrate, as Peterson would say, that was major. I started listening to Maps of Meaning like, shit, it's got me. <laughs> like, I can't reason around this. <laughs> Clearly, I don't know anything about myself. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I would probably either end up again at Buddhism yeah. or Stoicism. Probably Stoicism. But that doesn't give me the sense of community that Christianity yeah. gives to because I live in a Christian village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other end, do I want to go to church and kind of be like, yeah, about most of it? I mean, the singing, not my thing. <laughs> but the, I mean, I kind of wait for the sermon. Like, is the sermon there yet? Like, oh, more singing. Can I maybe leave for it? No, I can't. But <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I don't, I don't expect you to have answers, Paul, but I need to talk to, to somebody about this stuff. Uh, well, you know, to, to make you feel better about not living in Sacramento, um, there are plenty of empty seats in my church, and it's, it's hardly like people are crawling all over themselves to get in here. And one of the things, one of the things that I realized very early on about church is, is that there's a, de there's a degree to which church is an acquired taste. And, and what I mean by that is, let's say, let's say, so I have a friend, I have a friend who flies in from Florida every year or so and goes to a, goes to his Zen Buddhist master up in the foothills and spends, you know, a week, you know, eating, you know, nuts and berries and meditating 14 hours a day. And sometimes he comes up in the fall and I think it's getting cold up there. And I'm thinking, yeah, would I want to do that? No, but he does. So, okay, it's an acquired taste. And and there's an element to that in church as well. You know, I I don't know. I Of course you're talking to a reformed pastor, so why would I think why would I be worried about what's happening to you? It sounds delightful. Is it complicated? Yeah. But it's what what you said to me, I mean, 
what you said to me is striking in, in terms of, you know, you're, you're experiencing, you're experiencing a new self. You haven't had negative emotion. You haven't, that's very interesting. And, and, and in, in biblical terms, that's, that's essentially called conversion because, you know, that you're, you're a, you're a new self. That's, that's, those are the terms that the Bible uses now. Obviously, you're sitting here thinking, but you're sitting here watching yourself and saying, hey, wait a minute, what's going on with me? And, and it's, a good, it's a good strategy to check with your wife because it sounds like you have a wonderful wife who is wise and balanced and, and you, have a wonderful, you have a good relationship with her that you can speak honestly to each other. That those are huge advantages over, over what many people have. And the, the understanding about the singing, and that's, that's I totally get that. There are many churches in America where people just go for the music and don't care about the sermon, um, <laughs> because. But the the Dutch don't the Dutch don't do it that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Dutch the Dutch in some ways the Dutch singing is kind of like Dutch food. You know, I live in California, so we eat Thai food and Mexican food and Chinese food. There are no Dutch restaurants here, just like there are no dangerous English. ground here, Pastor. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not going to talk. There's some things you're going to talk about. Talk about Dutch food. <laughs> the Dutch do. Bitter, ball, bitter balls are great. The strofe waffles, the, oh, I mean, yeah. the, the desserts, the chocolate, the cheese. Yeah, but, you know, meat and potatoes. <laughs> and then maybe a vegetable. But, no, I, I, I don't know. What, what, how, where, who am I to critique what's happening in your heart and in your life? It sounds very normal to me. You know, when I'm I sure. look at when I look at, so one of the things, interesting, because this has been all new to me too. I mean, I've been on this crazy mission for six, eight months now where people like you called me and say, I got to talk to you because you, I heard something in your video. And I'm just surprised anybody watches these videos at all. I, I showed one to my wife once and I sat there the whole time thinking, oh, this is just misery. Why does anybody watch these things? But then people write me and say, oh, your video has been very helpful. And I think it's just helpful to me. That's why I do it. So I, I'm not surprised by anything that you say. I, you know, obviously I have some education in, in a variety of, you know, I've got Karen Armstrong's Buddha here and I've, I, I've thought about these things for years and now none of us are, are, are products of a clean room. So I've thought about these things for years, and to me, what I'm doing is the most rational thing I can do. <laughs> I was listening to, I haven't done a video on this yet, I was listening to Greg, Glenn Lowry, who is a professor of economics at Brown, he's in his 70s, he's on bloggingheads.tv, he and, and John McWhorter talk about race quite a bit, which for me, growing up in a black community, and my own story, is very pertinent, but Glenn, Glenn Lowry talks about, he's, he's in his seventies now. And for a while he spent time in an, in a black evangelical community and he left that because he just simply doesn't believe it. And he really wishes he could believe it, but he doesn't because it's just so useful to, to, to live within this, to live within this, constructed universe of of a god of love and justice of of our short story being part of a much longer story you know i i'm not surprised peterson is is doing this to people because to me it's it's extremely rational and the difficulty i think people have had is that there's been a there are some really good reasons to have the kind of response that you had to the story of of Elisha and the prophets of Elijah and the prophets prophets of Baal, and your story of hitting about eleven or twelve. You listen to this and you think, ah, you know, this doesn't make any sense. That's a very common story, but then at some point to begin to see the Bible through some new eyes and to begin to understand the role that it has played in the formation of the formation of the critique that you give to that story 
And that's one of the powerful things of the Bible is that a simplistic reading of the Bible is that here's a bunch of rules or here's a bunch of fact statements. This is kind of a Sam Harris reading of the Bible. Here's a bunch of fact yeah. statements. Boom, here it is. Once you start actually reading the Bible and studying it, you very quickly realize that's not at all what the Bible is like. There's, so you have the, you have the story of, of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, but within the same book, and not only the book of Kings, but other books, you begin to realize, say, you put the book of Kings next to the book of Ruth, where the book of Kings basically says, you've got to keep to your own, and you've got to fly straight, and you've got to keep you know, bad things out of your life, and you've got to take evil seriously, because, because it can seriously destroy your life. That's true. But then in the book of Ruth, you have this Moabitess, which if you understand all the way these stories of the Old Testament work together, when she comes into Israel, you know, Boaz should have never taken a look at her because if you go all the way back to numbers, you know, people, the, this definition of zeal was, you see an Israelite having sex with a Moabite woman, put your spear through them both in the act of copulating. And that's what, ha that's what Phineas does. And this is a this is a paradigmatic story that holds all the way through the Old Testament. But here in the book of Ruth, this Moabite woman basically saves Israel. And, and you think, well, how is that in the same book as Kings? It's because we're having this conversation together about, yeah, you know, don't let evil into your life because it will destroy you. And be careful what you think and the commitments that you make. And don't let your religion become too mercenary. You need fidelity. On the other hand, God uses strange things to bring his people around. And both of those things are true. Well, how do we integrate those in our lives? Well, that's what you're working on right now. So on one hand, you, you walked away from this Reformed church saying, oh, this, there's nothing here. And... I, what you described in terms of staying up at night, there's a movie out right now, fascinating movie. Um, um, sorry to bother you, something like that. And it's a story about a guy who gets in a call center. And if you get a chance to see this movie, it's, it's one of the more original, refreshing movies. I, Peterson might hate it, but it was a cool movie. And, but this, the movie begins, he's sitting there with his girlfriend, whose girlfriend who really wants to kind of, you know, they're in bed and she wants to have at it. And he's, he's just saying, I'm going to die. Everything I've, everything I've done is, is going to go away. I mean, he's having, what exactly you talked about. It's how the movie starts. And, well, here we are at this point in time. Of course we have these thoughts. Our, our hearts yearn for meaning. And the only way we're going to appropriate meaning is through story and, you know, the hero's journey, let's say. <laughs> I, I've got, and I've got no Everything that you've described to me sounds completely rational and utterly believable. And the fact that there are a lot of people that are experiencing this now doesn't surprise me a bit because in terms of my own life, you know, from the outside, well, you've been in the church your whole life and you're a Christian minister and you're raised in the church. Yeah, but I live in the same waters the rest of us do. I have all these same questions. So that's what I talk about. That's what I'm... I, and it's, it's a live process in my heart. There are times when I sit there and think, now, Vander Clay, you've spent 55 years of your life investing in this God thing. What if you're wrong? You know, what if, what if, what if you, what if you could have more fun by cheating on your wife and duping your church or making lots of money? Because in some ways, the choices I've made in my life make no sense in terms of this world. And so there are other things that talk to me and say, you know, get what, what if, what if this is all there is, you know, go and be a hedonist for your last 20 or 20 years of health. Well, that statement has two sides. Yeah. What well, I'd like to hook into that. Uh, Cause I'm kind of at the stage where, okay, I've, I can deal with the idea that I'm a, I'm a continuation of stories. I'm just sitting here and I go, okay, this is my story. And my story has an end. And that's okay. And like, that's major. The fact that I can accept that is major. And like, and, and oh, I'm just happy to exist. And that's even weirder. Like, I don't know what to do with the idea that I'm okay. Like, I'm not, 
you know, I shouldn't be hating myself all the time. That's, that's, I, I don't know what to do with this existence. Like, well, now what? Now I'm basically open to do anything I want. Uh, and I go, okay, so I'm looking into religion. Like, well, same question. What if I'm wrong? Well, because if I don't pick the right one, and uh, that's basically Pascal's wager on the wider scale. I'm like, wait a second. We are not, we are not seriously con- considering the, the concept of A, a soul, and B, hell, because we're not taking it seriously. <laughs> and, <laughs> I know, right? I shouldn't even be thinking about these things, yet here we are. And like, well, and, and people at the fire department, like, well, just try praying. Like, how do I know who I'm talking to? It could be lying. It could be talking to Odin. Well, Valhalla doesn't sound so bad. I mean, I'd have to die in battle, but maybe. but it could be, you know, it could be Allah, it could be Enlil, uh, it could be Baal, probably not. But but that that's because I could ask you, hey, uh, Paul, you know all this stuff, you know, and you you have read all these books and you've been a minister for so long and you, you believe, and you've, you've made that leap, and like, why do you believe? But that's, that's not a question that even if you answered it, would transfer to me, at least I don't yeah. think it would. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, I, right. I, I, you know, I look at it, I have, I have in a sense a form of Pascal's wager in my mind. There's a certain amount of, in, in, as a pastor, we have this phrase called paying the rent. Most pastors have certain elements of their job they like to do. And there's all this job that's just a pain in the neck. And, and every job has that. And it might be administration if you don't like administration. Or, but sometimes it's just the, the banality of life. People come to you and, oh, pastor, blah, 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 blah. they've got troubles. And, and so you listen to them. And then you, you try and give them an answer. And you know full well that they're asking for advice and you give them advice and they're never going to take it. They're never going to do anything about it. They're never going to change. <laughs> and you sit there for the millionth time and you think, uh, but, and, and this is where, this is where the majesty of the Christian story comes in. Because what, what's amazing to me is that we live in an age where common people like ourselves can, in a sense, have the leisure and luxury that Marcus Aurelius had. You know, that, that, that's, that the vast majority of human beings who have ever lived have, have simply had to spend most of their life just trying to scrape an animal existence together. And yesterday I did a conversation with Jonathan Peugeot and, and Greg Glyer about living in the third world. And that was one of the takeaways I had living in the Dominican Republic was that these Haitians, they're just screwed. And, and, I, and that helped me, you know, and I, I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey with my father living with people who, you know, working with people that they were, they were always going to be poor. Their, their black skin was always going to be a problem in this culture. Um, you know, all, for all of the, for all of the things going on, they were never going to have a nice life. It was obvious. Maybe they were sick because if you, if you live in a poor section of town, that's where all the people stuck at zero tend to accumulate. And if you minister in an area like that, you very quickly realize, yeah, life is suffering. And for most of these people that they, they, they're not going to read, they're not going to escape it. And then I begin to understand why the craziest thing in American history is that the, the black people who were taken as slaves from Africa embraced and in a sense excelled in the religion of their slave owners. I mean, you would think if someone comes to me and they, they put me in change and they treat me like crap and they rape my, my daughters and they, they sell my family away, the last thing I would want to believe is their God who they are saying justifies the treatment they are giving to me. And this community goes on to not only embrace, but persist in the religion of their slave owners. And I think something's going on there. And I think it works for me, who has this life of a middle-class, comfortable leisurely existence i get to read for my job what what cooler thing is there than that but this works for and and this is what i saw in, with haitians in the dominican republic and what i saw with 
with black folks in the inner city in Patterson or Sacramento. I find people whose lives are like crap and they're filled with immense joy. And I think, well, this is different from, this is different from, they're not, they're not detaching. They're not critiquing attachment in their lives. They're attaching in a different way. And, and they know how to lament when the world, you know, that this story works for them in a way that scales to an unbelievable degree. And so then when I get, when I get skeptical about belief as modernity kind of forces us into, Sam Harris, if I truly, if I truly imbibe what Sam Harris is saying, he can't give me a reason why I shouldn't believe whatever the heck I want to. If I'm a materialist and I'm just this evolved being living a certain life, well, you can be a shallow hedonist, but you know, by the time you're Hugh Hefner's age, you just look silly and sick. Or you can give yourself to a story that on one hand gives you joy and blesses your neighbor. And I think, well, that sounds like a better deal. So why not? That's, that's, how, that's, how, it, that's how it comes down for me. Oh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess that could work. I mean, as a devil's advocate, I would say, well, there's, you know, Richard Dawkins' book, uh, Greatest Show on Earth, and like we're just wondrous, uh, wondrous continuation of these processes and that doesn't demean us in any way. I don't know. It's how I live most of my life. It's like, oh, okay, well, then you look at the Hubble deep space field and you're like, right, <laughs> so much for my significance. And that's, that's either humbling or, or freeing. Yeah. Maybe both. Yeah. Yeah. Have you read any C.S. Lewis? Uh, meh, I only screw tape letters. Okay. Well, that's a fun book. Uh, I, you know, when you talk about, I like I like um, I like the Great Divorce. It's kind of hard to read because Lewis uses a lot of people out of the middle of the century in England, which we don't know today very well. I also like the Last Battle of his Narnia series. That that of all of his Narnia books, they're children's books and they're they're Tolkien-ish in that they're fantasy. But I like the Last Battle because. It, it enlivens my imagination to what I may become, what I may become. And I, I've, you know, I'm in my mid fifties now. I, my father's dead. You know, what do I got? Another 20, I'm 55. My father, father died at 77. You know, I got another 25 years maybe of, uh, life around here. So then you ask yourself, how do you want to spend it? And I, I get to the point of saying, I want to lean in. I want to lean into the age to come. I want to lean in to the creature that God wants me to be, which is according to C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity is, is one of his most popular books, which according to Lewis is something that if I were to see myself as I will be, um, you know, is, is something startling and beautiful. And, you know, maybe I'm just, maybe I just live in my head. That's probably always been my way. I live in my head, but I, I, I don't know. And, and <laughs> I, I don't know. It's just what I do. <laughs> right. Um, and again, I, I didn't expect you to have the end. I, I mainly just wanted to have a conversation because, yeah, uh, I watch many of your videos and they've been influential. So, you know, I'm watching sermons in my car. That's, yeah, this is just weird. Uh, no, I'm honest. Uh, cause I, and I wouldn't if they didn't have something of value that, yeah. to me, clearly. So, uh, what do you need? I mean, what do you, I, I just want to. I just want to stay where I'm at. I don't want to regress. So oh. at this point, because I know this, this now, and I can't. That's that's. Well, maybe I'm maybe maybe I'm on a, a mania. You know, I don't know, but it could be. 
You don't. I know uh, manic people. You don't sound manic. That's, <laughs> Believe that's me, I know manic people who are truly manic, and you are. <laughs> I know what that looks like. But, right, but just, I've got some bad news for you. You will, if if you are experiencing a, experiencing a conversion, and now which language do we want to apply to this? So I'm going to grab Christian language off the shelf. I'm saying if if the Holy Spirit is quickening your heart where this usually goes is there's a kind of a time of there's just kind of a there's kind of a honeymoon period and then you know it's it's not unlike marriage there's a honeymoon period where oh i love my wife she's everything it's wonderful and then suddenly you both start to see each other instead of with the rose colored glasses on and that's when the real work comes but as with the marriage it's that real work where the actual gold gets refined and and then it becomes and then it you know when you first get married it's it's this heady infatuation and you're in love and it's wonderful and it's like i want to i want to live here and you never live there but if you actually follow through the process you begin to discover new gears and new depths where your the these new this new freedom and clarity that you feel then later has resonance because you understand the shadow side and you wonder, and then you get integration. So I, you won't, you won't, it won't stick. I can almost certainly promise you that. But then the question, then the question gets, okay, now, now how do I, what, what commitments do I need to make and what, uh, practices do I need to embrace to actually grow? And that's where, that's where the disciplines come in. And, and you say, okay, um, almost everything, and this is, again, a strange aspect of Christianity. Whereas one read on Buddhism is, this is a strategy to, to manage suffering. Christianity is a strategy to employ suffering because what Christianity says is that almost anything worth gaining in this world will be gained with suffering. And that's in a sense, so then you have some stoicism in there and you know, there, there's a, that's what Peterson, that's an element of Christianity that Peterson hasn't quite, fully integrated, but is certainly grabbing on to that there is meaning is more valuable than absence of suffering. And so when you pick up that heavy cross and you pull it up the hill, you will experience meaning. And even Sam Harris will exchange meaning for well-being. But here's the thing that I think Jordan Peterson isn't there yet. I think Christianity has a clearer vision of what's on top of the hill. And once there, there's a push and pull then, because once you, once, once you have a clearer vision of what lies before you, then you can lean into your cross and drag it with a new fervor and with another level of meaning because you know where you're headed. And this is something that the slaves figured out. Listen to African-American spirituals and all of this stuff about crossing over Jordan, swing low, sweet chariot. That, and the slaves had the sense of, did that mean getting you know, north of the Mason-Dixon line or over into Canada? Yeah. But there were multiple levels to it. And, and these levels then line up. And, and this is where, this is where the, the vision of the age to come begins to connect into the elements of this world and this dispensation in this age. And this is where it gets really fun when we're in a live action role playing that goes into eternity. So that's a bunch you take in. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> well, that's why we record it. You can listen to it again. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I need to figure out where to go from here. That's, and I'm back to like, okay, the only thing I know is that this state, because I'm basically free, 
I can focus on whatever my next action is, which is still very stoic. Yes. Which works. Yes. That doesn't mean that I can't go to church if at least the community helps me. Yeah. That's how I can sort of rationalize to myself, like church is okay. <laughs> if you, <laughs> what if are you, you afraid if you, of? That's a good question. And I think it's that, that I, that I, that I betray my rationality. And this, so when, when that, uh, my coworker asked me, Hey, will you come to church? I said, yeah, that's actually interesting. Cause I've been thinking about that. And you know, I kind of have apprehensions. He says, Oh, well, cause you feel like you're betraying your rationality. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right it's like oh shit <laughs> so yeah so it's a good question so what are you what are you afraid of i know that the church doesn't it's more like what will i become you know i'm trying to make sense of the unknown yeah as yeah. peterson would say what are you afraid of becoming Oh geez, I don't know. Very religious or something. It just seems what odd does that to me. Mean to you, or I don't know. Or taking taking Christianity seriously, accepting that Jesus Christ existed, or well, or that he was Jesus Christ was son of God, or that God exists. Yeah. Like, what do I do with that? So I was uh, I was going for a walk with my wife, and we walked through this small village, and it has a church, and I brought my journal because I figured my old journal on the way. Uh, and the church is called Avon Hazer. I'm like, okay, this is a little bench in front under a tree. So I figured I'll go sit there and I'll journal. And I figured, okay, Avon Hazer, this is how far God helped us or something in that regard. Yeah, so I journal to myself, is this as far as God helped me? And, and I'm, I could probably look up the entry. It's not that far back. Uh, this is where I started talking about religion to myself. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sitting in front of a church in town name, Aben Hazer, God brought us this far. Is God bringing you anywhere? Doubtful. You know as well as anyone who, that rationally, yeah, I, I like wiki little things next to my, my entry, uh, that rationally there is no God. Psychologically, though, that's a different matter. Your acceptance of the stories in yourself and your religious mythical substrate has definitely brought you further. Has God, lowercase or God, uppercase, brought you this far then? Be honest, isn't it more openness to the world and acceptance of your lack of understanding of your place in it? How is that different from accepting God's defined plan? And I'm thinking to myself, wait, wait, whoa, 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 hang on. This is the thanks universe part. Because God acts in the world and the universe is passive. And, and if you take Calvinism, then God's even more active in how he influences people. I mean, if I took Calvinism, then God is actively making me turn to God. And I was having a conversation with, with the church elder. And I said, well, that's not how this works. And he just laughs at me. <laughs> like, and, and I said, I said, you can't just have a God that condemns people for infinite, for finite sins to infinite hell. That's, that's not morally right. And he just laughs. He's like, you can't judge God. That's not your, that's not your, your, your deal. And I'm reading about Calvin's institution and Calvin's like, stop, stop trying to figure this all out. That's not your place. Work hard and hope that you're, that you're chosen in the elect. Okay. And we can go on the whole theological discussion about double predestination. And I'm more of a more of a Karl Barth supporter in that regard, because <laughs> I can rest assured that Jesus really proxies for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's all different discussion. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think I asked you on Twitter, like, what, what's the deal with the omnipotence and the, the all knowing and the all loving, and yet you pick and choose, and how does that work? And yeah. and suddenly my sense of morality is being applied to God, and then God goes, uh huh. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I, I stole that from you. I, I can't remember which sermon that was, but now when, when my wife and I have the discussion, we talk about this, and we go, yeah, God goes, uh-huh. Because <laughs> he talked about Job and Leviathan, Job, Job. You have this weird pronunciation of my name, like Job. It just doesn't sound right. <laughs> but, uh, 
it's like can you can you put the spears through you know uh leviathan's nose or something like that I'm like hey i never understood that book that way and i should know that book a little better <laughs> like you know did you do that no then stop assuming you know what i should be doing you know it's it's yeah we always know what to tell others what to do, what to tell rich people what to do with the money and how God should be intervening in the world. Now you talk about Ezekiel and, and, and Joria at the, at, the, at the gates of the city that's being besieged with the kids being eaten. Like, well, what's he supposed to do? He, he's, he's, he's at the catch in 22, as you said. I'm like, I never looked at these stories this way. And I mean, you said yourself, you're like, oh, maybe I'm on a, on a thing here and this might stop. I'm like, I, I like the videos. Please keep sharing at least the sermons because <laughs> they, they let me look at this stuff in a whole different way. And I'm still sort of ashamed of that as soon as I say that. Like, really? Really? We're reading the Bible now? Is that what we're doing? <laughs> I know. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's strange, man. I'll, I'll read the old Buddhist text without blinking an eye with the Bible. Oh, no, no, that's personal. We don't go there. <laughs> that's being forced to go until I was 18. We don't touch that stuff. Although I did like the, we had this church youth group until we were like, I don't know, late 20s or no, early 20s. And each of us would take a subject and we discuss it mostly just ethics. Now it's come with the, the theodicy, the problem of evil. Let's see ourselves reason out of the problem of evil. And you grow old and you're like, yeah, these aren't new thoughts. Kelvin got yelled at when he came up with predestination. And Arminius got yelled at. and People got killed in Dordrecht. And <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, right. the, pride, the pride thing is, you know, what's so funny about what the West is going through with Christianity is that, you know, you go to China and, you know, it's, it's different, of course, because the, the amazing thing about the Bible is that so many different cultures seem to grab, grab onto it, but they take it in new ways. And so the Chinese are, are going crazy on the Bible now, like it's the newest thing around. And people in the West are like, oh, yeah, I'll... I'll read Buddhism and I'll, I'll go to the coffee shop. And, but if I'm going to read the Bible, you know, I'll, I'll slip it inside a Playboy magazine just so people won't look at me funny. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Exactly. It's, 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 Oh, I'm a Buddhist. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. I read Stoicism. Oh, that's nice. Aurelius. Right. Yeah. Basil's reads that. And, uh, but, uh re Christianity. Oh no, no. Oh boy. Oh, get, get away from me. Uh, it's, it's just so, and I think you, was this one of your talks when you said that these missionaries brought Bibles to some country and then they left? Yeah. And, yeah, that, yeah. and then which people were those? They got well, this whole new interpretation. Well, it's happened quite often. Um, but there's a guy, Roland Allen. Roland Allen was a, a missionary in the early 20th century. And, you know, the, you go into these places in the world where there's just chaos. And then he discovered that, this is humbling, he discovered that the mission outposts that he couldn't get to visit were doing better than the ones he visited. <laughs> wow. Which says, yeah. Maybe I should, maybe I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> and, but this has been the experience throughout the world that the missionaries go in and they try and do stuff and things just kind of, eh. and then the missionary leaves and the nationals take it. And they say, Oh, we can do it like this. And of course the missionaries look on and say, well, you're not doing it right, but boom. And yeah, there's huge problems with what they're doing, but this is the way people work. So, and I, I fully expect this to, I, you know, I really wonder, so I've been involved in church planting and church work all my life, but I have this meetup and I look at this meetup and I think, well, this is just kind of an interesting thing. How long will it go? I have no idea, but I love, I love the opportunity to do what I'm doing in this video and what I do at the meetup and, and to just talk to people and let people be free to say, I think the Bible's a load of crap. Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, if that's how you feel, tell me that's how you feel. And let's just talk about it because we could talk about this. <laughs> Nobody's going to burn you at the stake. But please don't burn me at the stake. Yeah. I know. Actually, I think for, you're the perfect person to ask this question. And this question has been with me for so long. And you're going to think, oh, it's something real profound is coming. No, no, no. Uh, why in the Old Testament does God keep saying, I am your, the Lord in capital letters? Like, don't the people know this? Because, yeah, 
he's talking to the what is the what is the significance of the endless repetition of do this and this and this i am the lord or i am god or something like that i'm batman he's he's defining himself for the people he's see everyone is assuming that baal hey dad molech the lord they're all they're all these transactional deities and the lord keeps wanting to say i am not like baal i am not like molech i am not like any of these things the the book of the book of ezekiel i mean then they will know that i am the lord well look at what that's attached to in the book of ezekiel it's attached to well when the when the when the Babylonians come down and destroy the temple and waste your cities and take your wives as their slaves and your children and kill all the men, then you'll know that I am the Lord. And it's like, I, uh, do I want to know this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point is that the, the point, the point is, is to understand ourselves in relationship to God. And, and as I, so the video I was working on yesterday I think what happened in the modern period is basically we've gotten a big head. We discovered that, you know, we can do something about the plague and we can do something about, um, about floods. We can build dikes and we can, we have medicine and we can, we can do all these things. And, and so we're full of ourselves. The, the irony is that we, and this is essentially what world war one taught us. Well, we're full of ourselves and, our biggest enemy is each other and the fact that we can't control ourselves. We have all this power and we're not worthy of it. That's exactly what drove Peterson into his, you know, into his obsession that yielded maps of meaning. Well, when you discuss, and I think for many people, it's, it's when it's, it's when you are 10 or 12 years after you stood after you stood in front of all of your friends and promised undying love to this person that you couldn't get out of your mind, eight, three, five, eight, ten years later, they'd become the devil themselves. Hmm. And then you do it again. <laughs> and I would almost say, well, then you will know that I am the Lord, and you're not. <laughs> and, and so you begin to realize well, maybe we're not in charge of our lives. And, and what you're experiencing is three years ago, you didn't sit down and say, well, you know, I'm going to listen to this crazy Canadian psychologist and he's going to make me rethink everything. And I'm going to, I'm going to visit church. <laughs> this, is, this is over the span of six months. <laughs> then you will know that I am the Lord <laughs> and you are not. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I, I called my dad like, hey, dad, I'm going to try this church when I come. And my dad's like, what? <laughs> Seriously. It's, and yeah, of course, he came along because dad still goes to church. But and the nice thing is he doesn't ask. He's like, OK, that's nice. it's not a problem for him. <laughs> Right. It's like, it's like, oh, it's, it's, you know, oh it's, it's, his son wants to go to church. Sure, why not? And, and you uh, know, what, when I asked you what are you afraid of, I mean, basically your answer was pride. Okay. Because, okay. And, and here's the crazy thing about pride. Of course, Augustine sees pride as, as kind of the cardinal sin. It's the root sin out of which all the other sins come. Well, the, the, the crazy thing about pride is that you can't avoid pride by being in church because very quickly what you do is you appropriate church and this is probably part of what repulses you about church is you, you appropriate church with your pride and you make the church into kind of like the ring of Sauron. You make, you make the church a projection of yourself, which is quite frankly, in my opinion, far more damnable than avoiding it. And wait, wait, can you reiterate that one? You make a church a projection of yourself. What do you mean by that? People do it all the time in church. They make, they make, they, they make the church, they use the church to enhance their own self-righteousness. Because all along the way, they've been thinking they're a good person. And whether that means they're rational or they're smart or they're moral or they're responsible or they're faithful, whatever, whatever frame in which they have identified their own self-righteousness, they then grab church and use their, the fact that they never miss a Sunday, the fact that the church has elected them to office, the fact that they give money to church, the fact that they, 
sacrifice all they have to the flames, you know, first, uh, first Corinthians 13. And they take, they take what should be God's gift to them, which is the church, and they use it actually against God. And all along, they do this in a way that makes the church impossible for people who really need it to get in. And this happens again and again and again throughout Christian history too. So right away you think, okay, well, I'll go, I'll go to church and that'll fix me. Uh, now you've got new levels of, now you've got new levels of temptation. And so, and this is why I get, this is why I'm a Calvinist because I, I think through all of these ways, all of these ways that I imagine tools that I can use to save myself and each one of these tools my heart can twist and employ to once again make me a rival of God. And, and quite simply what the Christian life is, is relinquishing yourself and saying, I am a lousy God and I need a better one. Would you take me in? That's the heart of the Christian life. And the rest of it is the kind of stuff that stories are made of. Mm, okay. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I'll get to, to the lousy God. The, the, the lousy, uh, I need to be taken in by God part. If I think, why would I? Why do I want to go to church to listen to the sermon? Basically, I hope it's a good sermon, and then afterwards, I hopefully I can discuss the sermon with other people, and we can kind of have have deep conversations the way I noticed that people want to have with, like they listen to John, Jordan Peterson talk for hours. You know, or people find pastors online to listen to their videos, and <laughs> so we'll we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I yeah, I probably should keep looking around. <laughs> that's that's the most honest I can be, Paul. Because that's beautiful, it's fine. Clearly, it's working. Yeah, it is. Well, and and at some point. At some point, one of the things that you'll, we, we approach, uh, we are formed by our culture. Our cultures form us as consumers. So I am going to look around for a spirituality that makes life work. Okay. We don't like it when anyone else treats us that way. So we do look around and, and it is important to find what works and it is important to pay attention to yourself. And you have via Buddhism and stoicism developed some really good habits of resisting living your life. And screw tape letters is basically about the stupidest way to live your life is to be a mindless consumer of endless diversions and entertainments that our culture is increasingly able to deliver at a very economical rate. And so screw tape letters is it it doesn't surprise me that screw tape letters is one of the books that you've read because it's very similar to what Jordan Peterson says do what it's meaningful and not what is what's expedient. Because Lewis basically says in screw tape letters the easiest way for a devil to to capture a man's soul is to keep them busy with endless fascinations. And now you have developed some habits of saying all right and Buddhism's really good at that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut down on the noise, and Stoicism is very good at saying, okay, let me think rationally about how I should manage my life. So you, you've already developed some resistance to the the common pitfalls of our contemporary situation, and now that is driving you to deeper questions. That's a fair analysis. I have to be honest about the screw tape letters. My wife recommended it to me. I didn't know it existed. And and I listened to the audio book by John Cleese. And now I have a weird association with how devils sound. Because <laughs> <laughs> imagine you go to hell and everybody sounds like John Cleese. <laughs> Just... I hadn't heard that version. That's got to be hilarious. It It is. It's really good. And... Yeah, and I found this this paper copy in a secondhand bookstore from like 1948. It's old Dutch, pretty good. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, we've been about an hour. I mean, I keep going, but it's, the, yeah. I liked that you said, by the way, in your recent video, well, it was in the comments, you have a video series on Jordan Peterson's, uh, what's he talking about? The Ark of the Covenant, and amongst a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, yeah. And somebody in the comments talked about hell and, and Gehenna. And you talked about Gehenna, like, oh, that's the valley where the children were killed. I had no idea. Like, why don't they tell us this? Because <laughs> it's all so literal. And uh, are you familiar with the book Salad? Salad by Reza Aslan? Oh, a little bit. I haven't read it. Uh, I'm not sure what you would think of it. Uh, I've heard some bad opinions about it in, in the history subreddit. Um, I read it. I it showed me a bunch of stuff and it makes me grab the Bible like, oh, does that really say that? Oh, oh, how is Mark different from Luke? Uh, yeah. And also about the sacrifice and the sacrificing, the, the connection between heaven and hell. And I love that stuff. It's like, yes, that, that's why I listened to Peterson's Bible series. It's like, oh, so that's what this means. Now I can work with it because now it's been demystified and now it's rational. Right. And, and, of course, it's still not all rational, but yeah. And then you go to whole, the, I think you said that in the video I was listening to about Jesus and the bread is, the, the bread is, uh, is, 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 it replaces the sacrifice. Jesus' body replaces the temple. I'm like, I never thought about that. That's, wow. Like, now I, now I have something to work with. It's no longer woo-woo, as you would say. Yeah. And yeah, so. I don't know. I'm just I'm just kind of rambling at this point. Um, I, had, I had actually a question earlier. Now I can't think about it. I don't know. It's probably something about Jesus. And <laughs> oh, right. Uh, I think it's in. Is that Matthew or Mark? The story with the loaves and the fishes. Matthew and what, Mark both have it. I should have known that. I'm sorry, Pastor. <laughs> Actually, that one's in all four Gospels. It's, I don't know, like when you're told that as, and when you're younger, you think, well, clearly that's not possible. We dismiss that, right? And right now I would say, well, what does this really mean? So have I guessed right that that story is about if you spread the news or the good message among everybody, everybody gets to eat or something like that? <laughs> that's a pretty good that's a pretty good idea. I, I would rec again, I can't, I can't recommend C.S. Lewis highly enough. I think you'll probably find his books fascinating because if there's anybody that's rational, it's C.S. Lewis and he, the, the guy is brilliant. Um, Screw Tape Letters was one of his earlier books and it was the book that kind of put him on the map. Uh, miracles in his book, Miracles, he, he goes into miracles of the old creation and miracles of the new creation. One of the things about Jesus' miracles that's, that's really helpful to understand is that Jesus isn't just doing tricks to get attention, or Jesus isn't just doing tricks to show his power. Jesus' miracles are, is in a sense, performance art. They're embodied sermons that express what Jesus is about and what his mission is. So he, he, in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is tremendously popular. Everybody's excited to watch the miracle man do his things. People are, people, people see opportunities. And if, you know, if there's someone divvying out reliable miracles, you are going to draw a crowd. And so Je Jesus is way out in the middle of nowhere with all kinds of people around him. And Jesus, poor disciples, Jesus there's a reason they killed this man because gosh, what a pain in the neck. He turns to his disciples and says, Hey, you know, we're all out here. It's getting late in the day. Everybody's hungry. Give them something to eat. The disciples are like, Oh crap. You know, they look around and they look for some food. Like that. We got five loaves and two fish. And Jesus says, all right, feed them from that. And they're like, what do you mean? And then, he sits down and he prays and he starts breaking and the loaves and fish are multiplied. Well, well, what does that mean? Well, well, this is, you know, this is in a sense a miracle of abundance. And 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 what's crucial to the miracle is the inability of the disciples 
to do what is necessary for the demands of the crowd. And the capacity of Christ to embody what the crowd needs, even if they don't fully understand it. And then they have these 12 basketfuls left over. And so what's that miracle about? Well, these miracles are kind of like, you know, you know what Cohen's are because you've been working with this. These miracles are things that you, you can just keep pondering. And the more you understand the construction of the story, the deeper the miracles get. And, and so often people dismiss them. All these are just, these are just stories that justify Jesus, Jesus, you know, that, that Jesus is special or Jesus has power. Well, certainly the story is remembered because it's extraordinary, but, you know, the water to wine at Cana and John, you've already got people who have probably had more than enough to drink, and Jesus makes an absolutely insane amount of wine to give to people who are already pretty well soused, and God does this? What is this about? And this is why... This is why the internet is good for the Bible. People say, well, people discover skepticism, but so many churches rely on, well, we're going to keep people in a little bubble and we're going to keep them from information. And what they don't realize is that, just like you said with Gehenna, you start picking, a, you start picking at the Bible and you begin, you begin to discover, well, people have been writing and reading this book for thousands of years. You're, you're not going to get to the bottom of it. And this is, again, what's fascinating about Peterson. Peterson had a story similar to yours you know, rejects, gets, gets out of church at 12 and his parents aren't going to make him go. And, you know, then into the Cold War and then trying to figure things out. Well, then he discovers Jung and Jung is reading the Bible and Jung is reading it in weird ways. And, and, and he starts to get into this and he begins to say, hey, wait a minute. What, what? I, I keep reading these stories and they just keep going further. And, you know, so this, the, the miracle has this meaning. Yeah, it does have this meaning, but this meaning probably doesn't exhaust the miracle. Which keeps pastors in business because you can preach the same text again and again and again, and, and it keeps giving more light. Okay. Well. <laughs> that probably doesn't help at all. <laughs> no, now no, no, I'm just wondering if the, like the 12 leftover baskets represent the 12 tribes, and if so, what does that mean? Yeah, and, yeah. 12? 12? Not seven or nine? Or, I mean, this is how, and, and this, is, this is the problem in the modern era with the way the Bible has been read, because when we read 12, we're thinking, one, two, three, four, five, six, well, I'm not saying that there weren't 12. I am saying, obviously, the number is not coincidental. <laughs> obviously. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, people have been I, uh, arguing about this for 2,000 years. Right, yeah. If you look at the, the, at the councils in the Byzantine Empire, and uh, will you people just <laughs> come to a decision already? Uh, yeah, and and when I was younger, it was like, well, clearly this just proves that it was all kind of you know assembled by committee, uh, uh, but yeah, that doesn't really get you anywhere. I mean, I can rationalize myself into it in, 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 into a you know a squared circle, but it's it's not gonna right. Yeah, I I, I kind of uh, yeah, I I've, I've had a fun conversation. Oh, well, good. good to say to say the least. Well, um, I can stop recording now and we can decide what we want to do with it or... I, I can leave you with profound wisdom. Oh, please do. Give me profound wisdom. Right. So uh, you, you've, <laughs> you've quoted uh, a person called uh, P Peter Kreeft. Yes. Yeah, I, I would pronounce it Peter Kreeft. Uh, do, do you know what Kreeft means in Dutch? No. It means lobster. <laughs> Bucko has fallen. Where's Bucko? I didn't know. See, Bucko needs a little bit of air. He's uh right. Um, Kreeft means lobster in Dutch. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. He, you know, Peter. Peter grew up in North Jersey, same place I did. Grew up in the Reformed Church. 
I, I can't speak Dutch. So that's one of the two reformed churches. That's the, the, the state church, the one that was the state church. And he went to the same high school I went to, went to the same college I went to, and everybody saw he was going to be a brilliant philosopher. And then he joined the Roman Catholic Church and broke all their hearts. <laughs> he's still a philosopher. I mean, yeah, he is. And he's, I, he's a fun guy to read. I, I like listening to him. A lot of people in my segment of my denomination are still a little bitter about the whole thing, and they don't like how conservative he's gotten politically and all that stuff. But I didn't know his last name meant lobster. That is hilarious. Well, your na- your last name is interesting from a biblical perspective. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, so. and my last name, I I, I I I eventually learned. I think this was I think this was a name that the Jews made up who were living in the Netherlands, because it seems to be mostly amongst the Jews that were in the Netherlands. We I didn't know that I had Jewish background until someone did a genealogy a little ways away in my family. And then suddenly I figured out why there's all these Van der Klaes in the, in the, um, in the Holocaust lists. But, oh my goodness. And then I was able to go back and find my great, great grandfather who sent his son to America and none of the rest of the family went. And it's like, what did he do to get kicked out of the Jewish community? <laughs> <laughs> and they joined the Dutch Reformed Church in North America, and Ellis wow. Island changed the name, and it's this whole story. But I, I, one of these days, I've got to get to the Netherlands. I've never been, and um, it's flat. Yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> they also say it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I would say so, I, and I like living there. Uh, and that's all different discussion. If you do, it hit me up. Uh, yeah, we can go to church. <laughs> and I wouldn't understand any of it because I don't I don't speak any Dutch. Oh, uh, really... yeah. So, so, something about Pentecost and languages. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank right. you. Now, how do you say your, your name in Dutch? Job. Job? Okay. Job. Yeah. I remember there was once a, a, a newspaper article uh, which interpreted the, uh, uh, I think, uh, the uh, behemoth as a dinosaur. So this, this, this newspaper article said, Job and the brontosaurus. And uh, <laughs> so that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, and yeah, mom said, oh yeah, you should take that to school, show it to the teacher. Like, yeah, no, that's <laughs> that didn't go very well for that. Uh, yeah, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. It's it was fun. Well, thank you. Well, well, let me know. Let me know how things turn out. My mind at this point is, as I think we had a good conversation, I'd be fine putting it on YouTube. Uh, 